Welcome to the e-commerce hustle podcast, the go-to source for merchants, marketers, and entrepreneurs looking to build, market, and optimize their online stores. We dive into the nitty gritty of e-commerce through the lenses of real, fast growing, direct to consumer brands and industry experts to learn what it takes to succeed and scale to seven figures and beyond. So get ready to take your brand to the next level with the e-commerce hustle brought to you by Sendly. Hey there, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of the e-commerce hustle. I am one of your co-hosts, Caitlin Hutchinson, and I have here with me, I'm going to say it again, Mr. Andrew. (laughs) Thank you so much, uh, Miss Caitlin. My name is Andrew Christensen, and we are thrilled to be talking about all things kind of e-commerce today, and uh, and, and I'm pretty excited about this episode, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, and it's a it's a nice change up because today we're focused on digital products. So digital. I think did what was that? Digital. Yes, digital products. Um today we are welcoming our guest from True Fire Studios. They are an alliance of the world's leading online music education companies. They're passionate about democratizing music education by providing affordable Anytime, anywhere access to best in class artists and the most comprehensive music lesson library on the planet. And it's across all major instrument categories. So definitely an awesome business model I'm excited to chat about and really, you know, hits hits the heart because as a, a big music fan, a player of music, Andrew can't play any instruments. Just want to put that out there. Mm. But maybe you'll become a customer of True Fire after today. I actually think that I may. I might sign up my daughter as well. We're trying to learn some instruments here in this household, and we're incapable. We're incapable of not following a lesson. We need a lesson. Well, the good news is today we're going to hear about all of the ways that True Fire Studios can make you fully capable, Andrew. So I'm excited about this product for you specifically. But I also want to mention in advance, um, please go to their website, truefirestudios.com. Check them out because they are offering a promo code for 50% off, friends. 50% off. That is a great offer. Um, You can buy individual courses. You can uh, subscribe. It's up to you. But either way, get 50% off your purchase with the code HUSTLE. That is truefirestudios.com, and you can get 50% off with the code HUSTLE. And with that, let's jump right in and meet today's guest. And we are so excited for our guest today, Owen Grover. Um, Owen has spent the last 20 years uh, at the intersection of music and technology, uh, a founding member of the iHeartRadio team, uh, iHeartRadio, I'm sure you do as well. That's because of Owen. Um, Owen also served as CEO of industry-leading podcast platform Pocket Cast uh, prior to joining True Fire Studios as CEO in 2020. Uh, his career spans the worlds of podcasting, digital music, live events, and broadcasting. Owen lives in Brooklyn with his wife and son and is a passionate music fan. So, Owen, it sounds like you are like a thousand times more experienced at podcasting and audio everything than we are. Uh, so so teach us your ways. Uh, but it's it's a great pleasure to meet you and, and, and tell our audience a, a little bit more about yourself um, and, and what you're you're doing here today. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Um, it's great to be here. It's so much fun to talk shop. Um, I'm uh, yes, I do have a background in audio and podcasting, but I'm here today on behalf of True Fire Studios, which is the world's leading online music education platform. Um, we're really excited to democratize music learning through our apps and our websites. And essentially, it's really simple. If you want to learn how to play an instrument across a number of different genres, um, you know, we're, we're the place where you go. We've got great courses, lessons. Um, you know, we can teach you how to play your favorite songs. Uh, we can teach you about music theory if you're so inclined, but um, we can also just, you know, make your enjoyment of music making even better 
through our tools and our, uh, you know, our content. And, and we're focused on not only creating great outcomes for people who want to learn how to play their instrument better, whether it's guitar, piano, you name it, but we're also focused on great outcomes for artists. Uh, one of the ways that we differentiate ourselves is we work with incredible artist educators uh, who span a host of different genres and instruments, and we help them make a living through their art. And we're talking about folks who are great instructors all the way up to Grammy winners and everything in between. So it's great to be here because I love music education and uh, I love podcasting. So two great tastes. It's like a Reese's peanut butter cup of enjoyment. Whoa. I love it. And I'm, I'm loving that this is a like a music themed. I don't know about Andrew's musical background, but um, I play. I grew up playing piano and then I always got jealous of those people at parties where there'd be like a guitar and they would just pick it up and play because pianos are like harder to come by, you know, when you're trying to show off your skills. So I was like 20, I think when I was like, I'm going to just teach myself how to play guitar. And mm. I now knowing what I know about what you guys do, I'm like, this would have been great back then because I was literally on YouTube, just like Googling, whatever I could to figure out what I was doing. It panned out. I'm like no expert, but um, I love your guys' offering in general. Well, we'll set you up. We, we need to set you up, Caitlin, because you know YouTube is great, but YouTube is like anything else. It's a catch-all for any kind of video content out there in the universe. And <laughs> Yeah. You know, if you want to learn how to, you know, shingle your roof, there's probably, you know, a couple thousand videos on YouTube about shingling your roof, right? Yeah. Um, I'd like to say you get what you pay for. I mean, there's great content on YouTube, don't get me wrong. Uh, and I get asked all the time, you know, how do you guys differentiate uh, versus all the videos on YouTube? And, and I've got a, a pretty straightforward answer that I think will resonate with the audience uh, for, for this podcast because uh, I stole a marketing metaphor. So people talk about CTA, call to action, right? And so that's a, uh, you know, that's a phrase used frequently in the marketing world. And, and for us, CTA has a slightly different meaning. It, it's curriculum, tools, and artists. And that's how we differentiate. We differentiate based on the quality of our curriculum, the efficacy of the tools that we make available to learners. And we can talk more about that as well. And then also the stature of the artists that we bring into the platform to help educate. And that to me is critical. You have to know where your bread gets buttered. And I think from a market for, particularly for, you know, for a podcast about marketing, you know, focusing in on your differentiating features is such a critical part of the process of growing and, uh, and cultivating any business. So, so let me ask a, a question in regards to, I mean, well, first off, uh, CTA, I love that because uh, obviously we know that is call to action. It's something that we are obsessively focused on when we're thinking of marketing. Um, a, a lot of our audience also, they're marketers and merchants and, and folks immersed in the space. Um, so I'm sure it resonates with them as well. Um, thinking about uh, curriculum uh, in particular, in, in combination with, with, with artists, in my mind, I, I come from a higher education background in combination with marketing as well. So curriculum is is so crucial. And then how like the teaching methodology and pedagogy of of like how you approach um, educating folks. So thinking about this medium of of you know, Caitlin's learning on YouTube. I actually do a lot of learning on YouTube as well, but then I find I can pay a consultant or pay a teacher or read a book and I'll learn like 10 times as much and have a much better idea. How do you make sure that this mechanism translates the highest quality content um, in in the lessons that 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 you're leading um, to make it as easy as possible for folks to be able to make accomplishment, especially with something like music, in which I, I feel like y you have to take a, a single baby step um, and and then continue proceeding from there. No, it's, it's the right question, and you know I like to say. Uh, as a as a way of answering your question, maybe more broadly, is that yeah, sure, we're in the music education business. Uh, that that's clear. But what we're really in is the self actualization business. So you put it through the filter of what are people coming to us for? Why would they hire True Fire or Jam Play or Fader Pro uh, or Artist Works? Um, some of it might be uh, 
professional development, you know, we certainly have uh, professional musicians who leverage our platform. That, that, is, that is pretty typical, uh, but it's not exclusively so. In general, what people are trying to do is master a skill that is emotionally resonant for them. Learning music and playing music delivers a ton of joy and satisfaction and is aligned with, you know, a happier, healthier life. And, you know, there's scientific studies that prove this, right? You play, you get into that flow state, it's good for you. So at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're helping people realize who their true authentic self, you know, is. And uh, we do that through our, uh, through our products. So it may sound highfalutin, but I also think that having a mission is important. And at the end of the day, our mission is, is one of self-actualization, as I mentioned earlier. So it starts, uh, as you rightly pointed out, Andrew, with uh, a good sense of what the curricular pathways or the curricular development ought to be. Um, and that depends on the subject matter, right? Are we learning, you know, how to, uh, how to, how to play, uh, Delta Blues, for example? Um, or it might, might be focused around skill level. Are you a beginner, an intermediate, or someone who's been playing for many years and is advanced? And, um, you know, so what I'm saying is there's not just an X and a Y axis, though. There's like, there's yeah. a Z axis, there's an A axis, right? It's like, what instrument are you playing? What genres are you interested in? What sorts of techniques, you know? So it's multivariant is, is my point. And I know a lot of the marketers who listen will be familiar with multivariate testing, but it's, it's really thinking about that um, empathetic leap of putting yourself in the shoes of the learners and understanding what resonates and, and you know, where people want to go with their craft. No, I, I, I love that. So I, I, everybody in my family basically plays instruments except myself. And a lot of it is I've been resistant to like trying get started. So I actually really like this and I'm enthusiastic about the prospect of being able to utilize this myself 100% across the board. Um, one of our neighbors, um, uh, he's, a, he's a retired physician and he's played piano his entire life. And they invite us over for dinner parties every couple of weeks. And every time we walk up to the, his house, he's actually playing the piano mm. because it's what he does in his spare time. And it is like the most joyful, like serenading, peaceful sort of like entry into somebody's home ever when you hear someone playing music. And uh, it, it's something that. I, I like that you said self-actualization because when I think of me wanting to do it, I'm mostly thinking about me doing it just for like the pure joy of, of actually making it and, and enjoying it so much. Um, so tell us a little bit about the founding story of True Fire Studios and, and how it evolved to its current state. So I am not a founder of these companies. I was um, someone brought in by the investors uh, to help scale the platform. And the original notion behind this was that um, the world of online music education was rather fragmented and that there was an opportunity to create a greater impact by developing some scale in the space. And um, there are great properties out there. And I had a chance to meet with the founders of True Fire and the founders of Jam Play, which were the original two companies involved in the merger. And I just really loved what they'd been up to and what they'd been working on. And, and I had an opportunity to get to know the investors who are all music makers and love this space and are personally interested and invested in this category, as opposed to just finding it an interesting you know, investment play. And so the combination of the energy, knowledge, and experience of the founders and the enthusiasm and uh, wherewithal of the investors made it a pretty uh, intoxicating mix for me. So I think I, I originally heard about the role um, through uh, a guy called Bob Carrigan, who is now the CEO of Audible. Bob um, is a player for many years, loves bluegrass, was really interested in the space, and uh, had a good relationship with the invest uh, with the investment group, and you know he himself also invested in in this. And he reached out to me and wanted to talk to me. We we knew people in common, and I just fell in love with the idea of it. And I fell in love with the idea of democratizing music instruction. I really fell in love with the idea of making a big impact in the lives of the artists that we work with. I don't have to tell you or anybody uh, how much the music industry has been disrupted, even pre COVID, but certainly post COVID the world's changed enormously. 
you know, touring is more of an iffy uh, proposition than it used to be. There are festivals that are coming back, but it's not the same as it was prior to COVID. There's some pent up demand, which is great. Um, but, you know, even before that, the, the, the way that the industry has evolved has left some artists out in the cold. And for us, the idea that we can help artists make a living by doing what they do best is such an appealing part of the mission of the company. And so those factors came together. Now, in the case of True Fire, True Fire goes all the way back to a, uh, a labor of love project um, that was put together by its founders, um, you know, Brad and Ali and a few other folks over there. Uh, and they were using IVR. They were using uh, interactive voice response, you know, 800 numbers and so on. And that's how they started. And then they set up a website and it sort of grew and, it, and, and evolved over time. As a result of that history and that legacy, we have such a deep appreciation and investment in not only artists and their journeys, but we've gotten to know some of these folks really, really well. And I think it's a huge differentiator uh, that we have aligned our outcomes um, and our success with the artist's success. So that, that to me, I think is, is, uh, is a big part of the story. And as they've evolved, you know, all, all these technologies have matured and come, you know, come to the fore. There were certainly, you know, uh, no such thing as Shopify when some of these businesses were, uh, were originally launched. Um, and I also think it's interesting just from an e-commerce standpoint, uh, you know, there are people who use the web to sell physical goods and there are people who use the web to sell uh, virtual or digital goods, services, content, and so on. And those, those are very different models and very, very interesting to dig into as well. But at the risk of rambling, I'll throw it back to you. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I think this is great. I love that we're dealing with a digital product now on this specific episode, because I do think it's important to touch <clears throat> on that. And I'm really curious, you said you came in to help scale. So I'm curious, like, what are some of the initiatives that you took when you came on board to try to scale the platform, like what marketing channels were you taking advantage of? Like, how are you trying to differentiate yourself in this space? Because not too familiar with it, but I'm sure there are some competitors out there as well. So I'm just curious, how did you kind of find and target the right audience and then put your message out there? Yeah, so it's a combination of strategic and tactical uh, considerations. And I think that, you know, this is really one of the most interesting questions when I came in, uh, one of one of the sort of maybe the, maybe the guiding thesis uh, around the around the roll up of these different organizations was that these are great products, tools, and services, but just not enough people know that they exist, right? So really, what we're trying to address is an awareness question, right? Um, we have by far the most compelling and complete catalog of online music lessons and courses of any of the com competitors out there. And that includes scaled competitors like Fender. And then there, you know, there, there are some you know, folks that have been in the space for a while, like Justin Guitar, Guitar Tricks, and, and several others. So you know, we have depth of catalog. We have great artist relationships. But if nobody knows, there's no point. <clears throat> and so it's, it's looking at a combination of top of funnel and acquisition opportunities. And then also, how are you, um, you, know, how are you effectively handling the middle of the funnel? Right. And so when I came in, there were email programs, certainly, um, but they varied widely across the different groups. Um, you know, so, you know, just thinking about CEP, you know, consumer engagement platforms and um, where to lean in and how to, um, you know, how to take advantage of multiple brands under one roof. And are there scale economies there? And how can we um, do cross promotion? And that's not possible when you're running four different programs or you're running, um, you know, incomplete programs or differing programs across the, across the, the business units. Um, I think from a top of funnel perspective, it was just, um, you know, as simple as how are we thinking about paid um, in a way that helps us get the message out as efficiently and effectively as possible. Some of the divisions or some of the units, the business units that are in, in the, uh, uh, in, you know, underneath our umbrella had used Facebook relatively extensively um, I don't think we were particularly mature vis-a-vis -vis our usage of Google products. So we've really um, leaned into that. Those are obvious because that's a duopoly, right? But we look at stuff like how do we use podcasting, you know, and I mean podcasting advertising. How are we thinking about using Spotify? I mean, you know, there's some portion of music listeners who also would like to learn. 
how are we uh, how are we looking at uh, subreddits? How are we looking at there? You know, because they've the Reddit offering has really matured over the last few years, and I've got some friends over there, and I love what they're doing. They're they're really taking advantage of the moment that they have right now. Um, so those are just a couple of examples. For us in particular, top of funnel also means partnership marketing is working with the uh, with the music instrument manufacturers, or with the Gibsons of the world, Gibson Guitar or PRS or Martin or folks who make other uh, pieces of equipment that musicians use, pedals, amplifiers, string manufacturers, um, you know, accessory manufacturers, software developers who are you know creating software that allow people to record music at home or in the studio. Uh, so in that way, uh, those are, are, are channels that remain relatively virgin territory. And, you know, uh, just think about how, uh, how aligned we are. If you buy a guitar, but you don't know how to play it, you're going to abandon it, right? So every guitar manufacturer is trying to figure out how do you increase stick rate? Because what, what do they want you to do? They want you to love what you're doing so that you build out a collection of guitars or instruments or what have you. And so, you know, satisfaction and stick rate are highly aligned with educational outcomes. So, you know, those are a couple of the ways that we're thinking about it. But, you know, even tactics like how do we leverage push? Um, how do we leverage SMS? How are we thinking about the mobile experience versus the desktop experience? What sorts of tools um, are we thinking about? Um, what kind of promotions are we running? So all of that stuff, you know, and then and then leveraging the experience of, some of the older divisions to help ramp up some of the new divisions. But when we talk about scale, what we're talking about is, you know, exposing more customers, um, recruiting new uh, and more high profile artists and bringing on new partners. All of those things to me represent scale. I uh, love that all, all together. Uh, one of the things is obviously product, right? So, 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 so the way that you're delivering the, the artists that you're getting, um, the experience that you're giving to, to your folks is, is obviously world-class, which, which gives you an advantage of having a, a wonderful product to refer folks to, but you covered kind of the digital marketing channels. You also covered kind of the offline marketing channels, the decentralization of social media, um, managing complex database systems, um, in, in all of that. But, but one of the things that's most appealing to me, I'm, I'm the vice president of partnerships here is, is really that, you know, I, I often not only see the entire marketing landscape heavily, but partnerships, I think is one of the things that's most underutilized by most organizations. 100%. And, and you, um, you easily looked at who else has my customers and who else is trying to help my customers to get get to 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 with the same objectives with with the same self actualization um, storyline with 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 getting competent in instruments and so, so true and, and and you and and I think that looking at that avenue for you it just makes so much sense that it there there's a stickiness to that because it's such a win 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 situation for everyone um, if. People are more engaged. If you buy an instrument, if you go buy a guitar, if you go buy a ukulele, and you want to get started, and you uh, you you take Caitlin's route, and you sit in front of YouTube, I'm imagining that there's a pretty high non-success rate with that um, in, in a lot of ways. But if you went to go buy that guitar or ukulele, and they told you about um, the 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 True Fire Studios and the curriculum and the offering and the engagement and the artists and they highly recommended it or there's some sort of incentive to do so, um, I would think that the engagement is way higher, the success rate is way higher, and then of course everybody's going to buy more instruments, they're going to buy more accessories um, and something to that extent. I, I guess, what has been your philosophy around uh, creating brand partnerships for yourself? I, I, you know, I was going to answer this question whether you asked it uh, or not, um, because I, I, I do think demystifying the partnerships opportunity in any industry is, is so important to unlocking success. So what I would say about that is I think people have this um, misperception or, or misconception, I should say, that you've got to go to a, a partner, you know, with a huge endemic program and it's got to be incredibly innovative and boy, oh boy. And, and, and I'm not discouraging that. Thinking big is so important. But uh, what I have found in this role, but, but also in previous roles at Pocket Cast and iHeart, 
uh, is that um, if you can just put a simple, you know, solid single on the wall, to use a terrible baseball analogy, just start with a simple co-marketing program or, or a simple co-promotion program. It, it, in our, I'll give an example. So we work with, as I mentioned, musical instrument manufacturers, a lot of guitar manufacturers, for example. And, um, you know, it'd be one thing like on the, on the end of uh, the degree of difficulty, let's create a bundled product that we're going to sell to Walmart and it's going to have a beginner instrument and it's going to give you access to all of these lessons. And it's just going to be amazing. Well, you know, there's supply chain there. It's a physical good. There's a lot of stuff you got to unlock to make that work. It's not a reason not to do it. It's just understanding that that's running, right? And have you even started to crawl or walk yet? So how about something simple? They're already selling uh, instruments that they've got in market right now. What if you create codes and you give people access to educational content, your content, whatever it might be, um, just as a way to incentivize users to, um, to register their instrument um, for a warranty, right? So think about it. One of the things that's happening now for any manufacturer is uh, they're understanding the need to own their customer. In the past, uh, manufacturers of any goods or services, they, they, they might not own the, the customer. They might, sell, they might uh, sell to a reseller, and the reseller would own the customer, would own the history of the customer, their billing, their, you know, their contact information, and so on. In this day and age, um, you know, brick and mortar retail isn't what it used to be. Uh, and Amazon is a huge, uh, uh, you know, data hoover. Uh, it makes sense for a lot of brands that sell, uh, that used to sell through through sales channels to go direct. And we've seen that to be the case with musical instrument manufacturers for sure. Not all of them have set up sophisticated e-commerce operations, but all of them would like to better understand their customer. Yep. And so we can help them with that. And so just starting with a simple co-promotion, a simple gift with purchase or a BOGO or, or just a, you know, some kind of registration uh, you know, concept, starting with stuff that helps you get to better know and understand your partners, uh, demonstrate that empathy, work together, crawl, walk, run. I'm a big fan of that. I mean, uh, preach, preaching to the choir over here. I think, uh, Caitlin, do you have something? Yeah, no, I was going to just say, um, I obviously you, you got the plan down of how you're, you're spreading awareness, you're acquiring customers, but I wanted to kind of jump into the subscription side of what you guys offer, because I'm just curious, like what has that journey looked like? Because obviously the goal there is to retain those subscribers, which we're very familiar with, even though we come from a SaaS space, like that is our entire goal, basically. So I'm wondering for for you guys, when you go down that subscription pathway, what were some of the challenges with that? Because I also see you have like a free trial that you offer. So I'm just kind of curious, what was the overall experience? How has that evolved? How are you trying to retain those, like those first time subscribers? Right, right. So it's a little bit different for each one of the divisions inside of the company. But I will say this, Truefire, for example, which is our flagship brand, uh, they did not begin as a subscription platform. They began as a, you know, in the digital instantiation of the business as a place to buy courses, right, which you would then download and play locally, right? Now, we still have a substantial business in people buying courses. But we will find that people who really love the product will sometimes subscribe, which is, you know, you access through an internet connection, but then sometimes they want to have stuff locally on their machine and they'll download a course. So, you know, the first thing that I want to say about that is we are um, doing our very best not to make any decisions that are not informed by, you know, customer preference. I, I like to say I, I am not a, a mind reader, nor am I a tea leaves guy. I don't like to project into the future. What I tell you I am very curious about, however, is what our customers have to say. And I think if you're just focused on the audience and you're focused on your customers, they'll tell you pretty much everything you need to know. Now, you know, Steve Jobs didn't operate that way. I'm not Steve Jobs. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to be Steve Jobs. Um, so, yeah, you still have to make some calls. You still have to be able to put some conviction behind your investments and your products uh, and your product mix. But uh, in general... I find that it's safest to make sure that you're in sync, right? And so when you think about the advantages of uh, subscriptions, partially 
it's, uh, it's habit and partially it's also what's going on outside of your industry. So it would be one thing for us to be offering kind of an all access, you know, Netflix like product in a world where Netflix hadn't already habituated the world and Spotify hadn't already. But we uh, we're, you know, we're a smaller industry than they are. And so uh, looking to see, you know, the trends and how those trends are being adopted allowed us to say, no, subscription across the board makes sense because people understand the value of an all you can eat subscription. That work has already been done for us. And then it becomes a question of how do we think about marketing, right? So you can certainly market a subscription and that looks more like benefits, right? Like all the content that you want, anytime you want it on your schedule for a low, low price, right? Like that's, that, that's not emotional benefits. That's more like practical benefits. But often we do marketing that is artist centric. And that's more emotional because what you're saying is, oh, I, I want to be like this artist or I would love to be able to play with the same feel that they have or the same expressiveness that they have, right? And then it becomes about an aspirational approach to messaging. Now, that doesn't speak to business model. You could download a course or you could have a subscription model and still access the same content. But the fact of the matter is, is that we are, um, <laughs> I think the easiest thing to do, maybe put it this way, the easiest thing to do would to come in and go, oh, subscription, uh, sub subscription economics, that's great. Uh, let's move everybody towards subscription. The truth is some folks just want to buy one course. And to alienate those people, uh, I, I think you do it at your peril because some of those people who bought one course will decide after they bought that first course, oh, I'm willing to invest in a subscription now, right? And that's also the notion of a free trial. But the difference between a free trial and a course is a course, someone's actually laid money down. That's a much better indicator that they're yeah. actually going to spend money with you. They're invested so, in that. Exactly. They're invested. So, mm -hmm. so having that, uh, you know, that broad array of product and business model types has actually been a source of strength for us. I uh, appreciate that a great deal. And and what you what you said there we, is something that we see really heavily in the marketplace as well. I think when you're just starting from scratch, it could make sense to go all in one or the other, right? So individual products or subscription only. But you'll see that over time, fairly dramatically, co companies that are successful are diversifying their model heavily. So you'll see co some companies that they have 100 SKUs, but then they also have a few SKUs that are very oriented around subscription as an additional option um, to not leave money on the table. And then we've also seen organizations where subscription is the core model, and then they're finally convinced, why don't you sell some of these products individually? And they'll see skyrocketing success. So so really testing out different models of, of how your business individually and independently operates, I think is healthy. And you touched on something critical there as well. And and I'm a toe dipper most of the time um, with, 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 uh, with, with most of my purchases. Um, I am terrified of subscriptions because I don't want to cancel them, even if they're free. I, I, I need like a, I have a very high level of commitment, but I will buy products and not get the discount for subscription over and over and over and over again also. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a demographic there that is, is well served still. Um, and you're still creating the best customer experience through that for them. Um, so I, I, I think it's interesting how, how you've addressed a lot in regards to this already, but what are some of the challenges that you feel that you're facing right now in, in 2022? Obviously, we've had a crazy 2020 and this th there, there's been a lot of transformation in industry as it stood in the last couple of years and a lot of your involvement here. Um, where do you see the challenges arising now and, and how do you intend to overcome them? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And I, I really feel like I've been on a, uh, an incredible roller coaster ride of emotion. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, but it certainly kept me on my toes. So I took the job at the beginning of 2020. I essentially mm -hmm. uh, got into the chair the day that the world shut down. I mean, more or less, by, by a couple of days off, right? And so I, I come into a situation where the union of these brands was brand new. There are two, two brands in the portfolio we added to over the last two years. And um, there was just this incredible pandemic tailwinds because people were stuck at home and they took that guitar or bass or other musical instrument out of the closet that had been collecting dust. 
And that wasn't anything we did. Like, I can't take any credit for that. We were just ready for the customer when they came, right? Mm-hmm. And we did, we, did, we did spend into the tailwind, right, to try to capitalize on the, uh, on the demand opportunity, right? So, you know, when you talk about challenges, there's stuff that's inside of your control, which is about, you know, your go-to-market, your product, you know, your areas of focus, and so on, for sure. But then there's exogenous stuff that you just don't control, and so um, we had tailwind in 2020 and, and, you know, into the beginning of 2021, because there was still a lot of uncertainty and you're talking about a time pre, uh, pre-vaccines and so on. And then as we're coming out of that tailwind, what happens? iOS 14, right? And I will tell you that Facebook was particularly for two of the four uh, of the brands in our portfolio was an incredibly reliable, low um, CPA uh, uh, you know, tool for us. Um, and not just a tool, but also a way for us to, you know, start conversations and, you know, extend our audience through those platforms. Now I've been on the wrong side of some of these shifts in the past, and there's been a lot of conversation about how the algorithms changed. I just saw a great story about, um, little things, which was a a great lifestyle content business in, in New York, not far from where I'm sitting right now that grew to about 30 million uniques on the back of Facebook's preference for video. And then Facebook changed their algorithm and their business tanked, like literally almost went to zero. Now that's not us because we didn't build our platforms on top of Facebook, but our acquisition funnels were heavily Facebook oriented. And then, you know, I don't want to get too geeky, but I bet this audience will appreciate it. But, you know, all of a sudden your CRM uploads just don't seem to work anymore. Right. It's like the targeting is not there. And, you know, we all know it's been it's been uh, very heavily documented how those changes impacted direct marketers like like us. Um, But also folks in similar industries, you know, people who are trying to drive app downloads, for example, it just completely changed the calculus for them. Nothing we did, not because our marketing was bad, nothing to do with it an exogenous change that impacted the industry. And now we find out many, many months later after Facebook reported their earnings that it cost them 10 billion, billion with a B dollars. um, And it had impacts on all sorts of other uh, companies that were leveraging their tools. So, you know, it's hard to not lose sleep over something like that. But at the end of the day, we have no control over uh, uh, what I would politely call a disagreement between Apple and Facebook. But it had enormous impact on us and it caused us to have to really rethink uh, how we were managing top of funnel. And it, in our case, uh, tactically, it caused us to look at Facebook less as a way to acquire new customers off of the feed or out of ads, but more of a way to maybe do lead gen, right? And and it, it, it really caused us to pull back on spend. That's for sure. That is for sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have filled that gap through, I think, uh, a much more sophisticated deployment of, uh, of, you know, essentially suite of different Google products, because that's the other place where you get scale. There are certainly a whole bunch of other channels that you can use that are digital. None of, and, I, and everybody on this call is, or everybody on, who's listening to this will know, you know, it's a duopoly, right? There isn't really a third player right now. I think AOL wanted to be that third player. That didn't work out. I remember so, AOL. Well, Verizon bought it and they tried to combine it with Yahoo and they thought that's what we'll do. We'll become the third option. I don't think it worked to plan. Put it that way. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, Oath, right? Um, I I think that Oath had had good standing. Um, I think that Bing and and, and Microsoft still is is viable, um, but nobody is as powerful as Facebook, Instagram and and Google, right? Um, For 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 the majority. And I, I think it's interesting what you said. And obviously this is something that every single merchant and marketer can relate with. Um, iOS 14.5 um, has, has it caused kind of catastrophic change. And I was, I, I was at the forefront of a lot of that with a lot of the brands that I was working most closely with as well. So I, I, I have a strong sense of, of, of what that looked like and how those changes proceeded. And I am not surprised that Facebook, it cost them $10 billion um, uh, already and will continue to cost them more and more as things transition. Um, Have you found, it it sounds like, so you moved to Google a little bit more heavily. You mentioned something about Reddit as well recently. and, And I love Reddit as a channel, especially 
perhaps sponsorships of like music subreddits mm-hmm. um, or uh, uh, of, of different types, I, I assume could be strong for you. Um, have you found through like decentralizing in that manner or through going more for podcast advertising and other mechanisms that you've been able to create a new puzzle um, where Facebook is a lot less vital today? Um, and do you feel confident going forward with that? Or do you, are you, do you see it as a forever testing environment from here on out? I think it'll be test and learn for, for the, for the foreseeable future. We had some very straightforward upside available to us just because I would say some of the, uh, you know, tactical implementation of, you know, Google and AdSense products wasn't where it needed to be. Right. So I think, again, anybody who's got sophisticated, um, sort of paid media thinking will be considering things like geographies, right? So it's super easy just to say, okay, my customers are mostly here in America, but are you looking at other geographies where your products may be of interest, right? So looking at that, um, looking at the full uh, slate of, of products, I think we were probably a little underinvested on YouTube, right? There's a great place. I know, now, the irony of that, of course, is that I think we have, you know, well over a million YouTube subs um, across our brands. Uh, and so it's not as if we weren't using YouTube to, you know, create community, to post content, um, you know, as a way to uh, better dimensionalize what our products and services looked like, uh, you know, on a platform where there's, you know, literally billions of users. So I think it's just a constant review of not only what you're spending, but where you're spending it and understanding all of the different products and services. I do think that even all these months later, we are still in the process of trying to understand a little better, uh, you know, how to make up for that deficit, which is why you hear me talking about podcasts and Reddit. And yes, we use Bing, for example, and, um, and partner, uh, you know, p- partner resources and partner media. Um, I think one of the areas where there's lots of upside for a lot of brands is PR. Having a PR strategy and making, you know, and, and every industry that I've ever been involved with and many that I haven't been, you know, have blogs and online resources and, you know, newsletters and, and on and on and on that cover the space. It's, it is a truism of our age that, uh, you know, there's a light shined on basically every segment of every industry out there. So, you know, whether you're doing something that's SaaS or whether you're doing something that's, B to C, there's somebody, you know, who's got a sub stack about it, right? Or somebody who's got a newsletter or a podcast or what have you. And are you doing what you can to get the word out that way? Um, and, you know, having someone thinking about your messaging and, you know, what are the KPIs? Um, what are you trying to accomplish? In, in, in the space that I was in, I had the, again, this is exogenous. It, it was not about me, but I was um, running a podcasting platform in 2018, 19, and the beginning of 2020. I don't have to tell anybody here, like podcasting has exploded <laughs> in those last few years, right? And so uh, we had a good story to tell and we told it. And that led to hits in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and The Verge and Wired and, and on and on and on and on. And that was a a key, a key tenet of our marketing program was, uh, was earned media. In online music education, we have our version of trades too. That's like Guitar Magazine, Guitar World, uh, Musician, all these, all of these blogs and, and, you know, magazines and, uh, and publishing titles that cover the world of music making, right? And so understanding what the upside is there and how you can reach your audiences through these earned media opportunities and having a strategy and willing to be willing to invest in it, I always think is part of the success. The relative cost of pitching journalists with a coherent story and have and building out a messaging platform versus paid media is really low, actually. If you look at a paid budget versus a PR budget, you know, it's it's it, the PR budget's generally a fraction of the cost. So, and, and can have outsized impact when done right. Yeah. I I love that you have so many different channels that you've diversified your marketing to. It sounds like you've really paid attention to where is our spend taking us the furthest and not dedicating it all to one. Because I think a lot of times for brands, especially starting out, it feels like, well, obviously I do Facebook. 
or just mm. paid media in general. And that's like where I'm going to invest my time. And I love that you guys have really explored all the avenues, it sounds like, to really understand where your customer base lives, where you can resonate with them, whether it's a paid channel or an owned channel, especially when something like iOS 14 happens. And if all of your eggs were in just that one basket, now it's a much bigger pivot than it could have been instead, which I think happened to a lot of people. So it sounds like you guys have done a pretty good job of spreading spreading your wings across the board. Well, we're certainly trying, and not every one of these channels is equally successful. And I'm not going to pretend yeah. that every single one of them has been a home run. What I would say is any marketer should be thinking about multi, multi-channel reach. And you know, it doesn't mean that the investment is equivalent across the board. So like we use Bing, and we use it actually rather successfully. It's a fraction of our investment in, in Google. And that's just because you know, the opportunity on Bing is just not as big. If the opportunity was as big, we might spend just as much. But, you know, you have to understand the limitations and the parameters of each one of these platforms. And I think, you know, also understanding, um, for example, the distinction, I mentioned the distinction with PR between being in an industry that's heavily covered across, you know, both lay and industry media versus an industry like ours, which, you know, it's hard to get someone from Billboard magazine to write about online music education. Now we are, trust me, I'm working on it. I sat on a panel yesterday in order to be able to schmooze with people in the space, you know, and to talk to the reporters from The Verge and Bloomberg and, and, all, and Reuters and all these other outlets um, to get in front of them and say, hey, look, this is interesting. This is part of the audio story. This is part of the music industry evolution story. But you've got to be willing to get in there um, and every one of these brands, and I'm sure all every founder listening to this knows, the you know the senior executives, but particularly the the founders and the CEOs, need to be willing to enthusiastically and effectively tell the story of the brand. Yeah, that's a you, non-negotiable. CEOs yeah. do not get to ab- abdicate that, or and they don't get to just push it off. If you're not doing it yourself, you should not expect anyone else is going to do it for you. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, Owen, we're we're coming up on time, but I wanted to just say I really appreciate um, that at the core, you guys have a really solid mission and message that it sounds like this entire brand was built upon, which I think is always the, the overarching theme on these episodes is it comes from a place of purpose to mm. begin with. And I think mm. um, just talking with you, that really resonates with anybody listening, they can tell you're really passionate about what you're doing and trying to make a difference in what uh, how other people feel about themselves and impacting people with joy and being able to build them up. So I love that piece. All of the business aspects are great. That's what the podcast is here for. <laughs> Obviously, everybody wants to make more money, but I think it's always always shows the most successful people really started from a place of passion and purpose. So I really appreciate that about what I'm you guys going are. to, I, I am going to print that out. I'm going to put it in a digital, <laughs> you know, frame. I'm going to send it to my mom. I'm going to like, I, that's, I, I, you couldn't be more kind. And, and that's, um, that's so much, uh, that's so appreciated by me to hear that. Uh, I do love what I do. How lucky am I to get to work in this space? I never lose sight of the gratitude that I have. Um, you know, they always say the definition of success is, you know, you would do something, you love it so much that you'd pay to do it as opposed to getting paid to do it. And I do love this space. I, I, I not only love the, you know, the mission driven pieces of it, but I just think it's fun and interesting and I play guitar, not well, but so it just aligns with my interests and my passion. So I'm really glad that that comes across and I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you fine folks. Yeah, we're, we're we, so lucky to have had you here. We appreciate it, Owen. Um, is there anything else you want to share or maybe tell our audience? I know we have a, a, a code that they can use, but yeah. anything that you want to share with our audience that's like up and coming or you want to direct them to so they can learn more about your guys' products? Yeah, so we're, we're offering any of the listeners to this podcast 50% off their next purchase, whether it's their first or their second or their eighth or 10th um, on truefire.com. So 50% off. Um, hopefully we can put the code in the show notes. 
Yes. Um, It'll be code so hustle. hustle. Code is hustle on truefire.com for 50% off. Ever so generous. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And, you know, uh, if, uh, if you're, if folks are interested in learning more about our brands, we, uh, you know, we've got all the information they need at truefirestudios.com. That's not where you go to take lessons. It's where you could go to learn more about the brands in our portfolio. And then it's got links to all the sites, depending on if you're interested in, you want to learn about bluegrass or you want to learn how to do EDM production or what, what have you. Uh, and you know, all levels, all levels are welcome. And anybody who wants to learn more about music, come on down. Maybe we'll see Andrew after this podcast get on and try to do some try to do some EDM productions. Can't wait. Can't <laughs> channel, wait. Channel his inner DJ. Exactly. But um thank you so much, Owen. It was great to have you. Um and yeah, we'll catch you next time. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks, guys. Have thank you so much, one. Owen. All right, take care now. My goodness, Caitlin, was that a great episode? And oh, I, I, I wanted to make sure to compliment your hair because your hair looks great today. And also, what I will say, I will say, is that uh, if you're listening to this, you know that you can access these videos also on YouTube, so you yes. can actually see the wonderful hair that is before me right now. Um, but, uh, but, but we, we, uh, Caitlin, what did you think about the episode? Right back at you about the hair, Andrew. Um, no, it was great. I'm glad that we had the opportunity to dive into a digital subscription based product. I think that was a very interesting Avenue. Um, and Owen was great. He had a wealth of knowledge to drop upon us. And honestly, I feel like every episode, we could keep talking, but on some level, we've got to stop at some point. So it was awesome. Excellent. Excellent. No, I, I, I loved it as well. And I do think not only the business model of, of music education for kind of self-actualization is awesome. Uh, I, I really loved a lot of what Owen had to say as well. So as always, if you enjoyed today's episode... Um, give us that big heart um, by, by hitting that subscribe button. Um, share with your friends, um, loved ones, music enthusiasts, um, and uh, feel free to download other episodes. And if you're feeling extra generous, which I have a hankering, you may be feeling extra generous, um, please consider uh, leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. And as Andrew mentioned, be sure to check out our podcast on YouTube. You could type in Sendlane. You'll find all of the videos for the e-commerce hustle. Type in Sendlane. Type in the e-commerce hustle. You'll find us. We'll pop right up. You'll see our smiling faces. So if you want to put a face to our name, that's how you go about it. But yes, please like and subscribe. And don't forget that True Fire Studios is giving a discount a wonderful discount of 50% off, ever so generous. So I highly recommend checking that out if you're interested in picking up an instrument. Uh, check that out at truefirestudios.com. You can get 50% off with code HUSTLE at checkout. That's truefirestudios.com. Get 50% off with the code HUSTLE. And with that, I think that's a wrap, Andrew. That is a wrap. Well, thank you. Thank you for lending us your ears, your eyes, your, your emotions today. <laughs> yeah, your heart, your heart. We've enjoyed this and, and we, we can't wait for you to join us for the very next episode, which I think you might be even more excited about. You can tell by his high-pitched voice. It's going to be good. <laughs> so good. All right, Andrew, wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Man, and have a wonderful day. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.